Hi, uh, nice to meet you, Mr. McMullen. Um, and thank you everyone else for coming. Um, so Mr. I'd like to introduce everyone to Evan McMullen. In 2016, Mr. McMullen ran for president when no one else would. Since then, Mr. McMullen fo founded Stand Up Republic, an organization aiming to protect our democracy. So the way we're gonna format this discussion is the first 45 minutes, we'll have open-ended questions and questions submitted by attendees. Um, and then the last 15 minutes, we'll open up to discussion. So Mr. McMullen, I'd like to first start with your presidential campaign in 2016. Sure. As a conservative, why did you feel it was necessary to run as an independent? Mm. Well, thank you for the introduction, Alfie. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to answer that question. Uh, there were a few reasons why I decided to do that, why we as a team decided to do that. Uh, the number one reason was a modest goal that we had, which was to simply defend fundamental American ideals from the right on the conservative side. And people think that sounds, you know, quaint or overly idealistic, um, but, uh, but it, it isn't. And in fact, since Trump has been elected, of course, we hoped not to have that outcome, but since he's been elected, uh, a lot of our fundamental ideals, most of them have evaporated largely on the right. And that was exactly what we were concerned about and what we were fighting against. And we knew that we wouldn't be able to stop it, a modest, camp modest independent campaign like ours starting only three months before election day. Uh, but we were hopeful that we would at least be able to be sort of a, a Noah's Ark, if you will, of American ideals on the right to sort of you know, keep those alive through uh, an impending storm that we saw on the horizon. And we thought that would either be that Trump would win uh, or we thought that Trump would lose and there would be a, a fight for the heart and soul of the Republican Party. And we knew that we had to start that fight during the campaign if we were going to have any chance of fighting afterwards. We thought most likely Trump would lose, um, but we would have galvanized um, a, a network, a movement of support on, on the right during the campaign and, and built an infrastructure that would have allowed us to wage a, a fight for the heart and soul of the Republican Party after, uh, after the race. And in fact, it was shaping up that way about a month away from we had prominent Republican leaders, U.S. senators and others reaching out to us, asking us, you know, urging us to bring the, quote, fight back inside the family uh, after the election. And we said we were open to that, but skeptical that the Republican Party would reform. That was our early negotiating position. But we were shocked and surprised that, you know, Trump won on election night, or I should use one in quotes, because, uh, of course, his, his, you know, ostensible win is colored by the fact that he was supported by a foreign adversary in 2016, as he is this year. Uh, and so, you know, when he, when he did prevail, uh, though, we, we were prepared to continue the fight. And, and so one way or another, we knew that the, the cam our campaign would prepare us for whatever came after the campaign. Uh, then in addition to that, you know, we did want to give conservatives someone else to vote for. And you know, 2016 was different than 2020. In 2016, both sides, you know, uh, more uniformly viewed each other's candidate as polarizing. Um, our view was that Hillary Clinton was somebody who uh, differed from us on policy issues, but that Donald Trump was a true danger to the country. And that's what our message was uh, for the most part. And, uh, you know, we, we also knew that people, even on the right, who are anti-Trump, didn't fully understand the danger that Trump posed to the country. So those two things combined meant that we thought it made sense uh, to give conservatives someone, another conservative, to vote for, since the opportunity for, uh, for crossover voting wasn't quite as strong as I believe it is this year, and it wasn't as obvious. Trump, the danger Trump posed wasn't as obvious. Now, in 2020, that's different. You know, if you're paying attention, if you're honest, if you're not inside a Fox News alternative reality bubble, you know the danger that Trump poses to the country. Um, you know, Biden and, and uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have uh, made a great effort to run a unifying campaign. They've welcomed the support of uh, Republicans of conscience, disaffected Republicans, right-leaning independents. They've welcomed us to their coalition. Uh, you know, they take input from us. Uh, and, you know, they've run a unifying campaign and there are people on the left that don't, you know, that would have supported someone else in, in, in the primaries and people on the right who would, you know, prefer 
uh, a principled Republican uh, would run. Um, but uh, but that's those aren't our choices this year. But thankfully, we do have uh, a Democratic ticket uh, that is working very hard uh, to to build this broad cross partisan coalition uh, to protect our democracy, and and that's what we're a part of now. Yeah, thanks so much for that answer. And um, I just had a question with those ideals you talk about that represent the Republican Party, and that you you want. I would say you want the Republican Party to return to. So in the era of Trump, has our public discourse moved beyond decency and civility? Have we left those ideals of the Republican Party? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they've clearly, the Republican Party has, has abandoned civility and, and decency. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not one to make both sides arguments uh, in this situation. Uh, because I, I just don't think they apply. I think the Democratic Party under the leadership of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been, you know, it's been quite decent. And, uh, but there, you know, there are, I would call, you know, there are elements of the left and elements of the right that have become quite divisive and polarizing and, and indecent. Uh, and, you know, we should all reject that. Um, obviously, it's a much bigger problem on the right where the president, you know, leads, Donald Trump leads the Republican Party himself you know, a, a, a quintessential example of indecency and incivility uh, in his party and, and the Republican apparatus have, have joined him in that regard. Uh, and, you know, so, so it's, you know, if I, I think if you're fighting for decency this year, you're, you're on Team Biden um, in this election. So, um, but yes, I think it is a problem. And, but but I, I would like to share just my view of why it is such a problem. I think a lot of people dismiss civility and decency in politics as again, sort of an idealistic expectation that's unrealistic and unnecessary and maybe even not even good. Um, but I just completely disagree. When we treat each other with civility and decency, we uphold one of our founding values, one of our most important founding values, which is that we are all created equal. equal you know, we're, we are of equal value. We're equal under the law. You know, by my religious tradition, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known as the Mormons. You know, I was raised to believe that everyone is created equal. We're all of equal worth in, in the eyes of God. And, you know, you know this is, uh, uh, I'm sharing something personal here, but, you know, where I've felt, um, you know, the love of God in my life, uh, what it has taught me is that I'm not the only one who's special, but that, you know, I immediately see uh, the importance and the value of, of everyone else as well. Uh, and those are just my personal beliefs, but whether you know you're you you share those religious views or you're a humanist or or whatever, our system depends on our considering everyone, each of us, equal under the law and of equal value. And when we treat each other without civility and indecently, we erode our commitment to that truth that we are created equal and that we are that we need to be equal under the law. And that threatens our entire system. Uh, it also means that it's more difficult to find common ground on policy issues, on you know, to, to find solutions to modern challenges that we face, whether it's healthcare or infrastructure or information warfare or you name it. All of these modern policy challenges that we face that we need to solve so that our country can keep up and keep pace uh, with the rest of the world and so that we don't fall behind and so that we don't or dismantle as a democracy, uh, you know, all of that is seriously assisted by civility in politics and damaged by its by the by the lack of it. And so I, I just think it's absolutely critical to our democracy that you know that that we in our personal dealings uh, in politics engage with civility and that we demand that of our leaders. And I can say, you know, there I haven't been perfect in that either. I really try to do it. Um, you know, sometimes I say things or write things that I wish I wouldn't, and I try to, you know, take it down if, if, if I can. Um, I, I don't often do that, um, but sometimes I do, and I think better about it. But I, but I think we all have to, to strive, again, to do it ourselves, to be more civil ourselves, but especially to demand it of our leaders. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, and let's talk about why you founded Stand Up and like what inspired you to start that organization? Well, you know, I, I mentioned that after the election, uh, or we expected, we didn't know, you know, whether Trump was going to win after the election. If, if Trump had lost, 
you know, we thought that, you know, we would participate in some form in a fight for the heart and soul in the direction of the Republican Party. Um, after Trump won, it, you know, that, that surprised us. We didn't expect that to happen. And so we had to, we spent uh, several weeks reassessing and figuring out what we were going to do, what needed to happen going forward. And, um, and what we decided was that instead of building sort of a Republican conservative only organization to fight for the Republican Party, something much more fundamental was at stake. And that was fighting for our democracy uh, across party lines. And so we started this organization, Stand Up Republic, which was you know, designed to bring along the disaffected right, which we anticipated would have an identity crisis over um, conti around continued opposition to our, an elected Republican president. Um, but we also knew that we needed to unite people on the left and people in the middle in this larger effort to defend our democracy. And so that's, a, that's what Stand Up Republic was intended to become. And that's what it did, did become. Uh, you know, we recently held a counter convention called the Convention on Founding Principles. We did that during the, the Republican National Convention. Uh, over 650,000 people viewed speeches and panel discussions on founding principles. Uh, we had 20,000 people, almost 20,000 people, 19,000 and something register uh, to attend the event. Uh, we had uh, over 450 delegates from all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico, draft and ratify a declaration of principles and uh, a found, you know, principles that can unite this country and move it forward. And 39% of those who, uh, who participated in that counter convention were Democrats and the rest were either independents or Republicans. And so that was a very recent thing we did. Uh, and it was really evidence, uh, this whole event was built around our founding principles. And it was, it was a, a very inspiring, um, energizing, uh, very inspiring and energizing to see Republicans, Democrats and independents alike united around these, these, these principles. And so, you know, we've pursued that fight. And I have to say, it hasn't been easy. I mean, we've had, uh, and you'll find this in politics as you go forward, if you pursue careers in politics, especially when you become a leader, if you have a voice, you know, you'll find that people, you know, people want to have influence over your voice. And some of those people are donors. And so you need, you need the board in order to do your work. And they have their own ideas about who you should be. And we had major donors, even in the pro-democracy space, tell us that, no, you can't, you can't do this work in a cross-partisan way. It has to be partisan. Um, and, you know, we, we even lost funding opportunities by standing our ground on that and saying, no, we're going we're gonna to build cross -partisan, uh, a cross-partisan uh, network and, and movement across the country of Republicans, Democrats, and independents, because that's what's required to save our democracy. And it was, it was unfortunate, you know, to lose that funding, but I'm glad we were true to ourselves and true to what was needed. Others came to us and said, look, you guys, you, you need to be you know, further, you need to be a further right than Trump position on the political spectrum, further right than Trump and anti-Trump. Uh, and, uh, and that's the way you're going to weaken him and take away votes. We refused to do that too. We thought that would be destructive. It wasn't who we are, were. And, uh, and we, you know, maintained our commitment to um, building bridges across the political spectrum to impact political change in the country and, and to protect our democracy. And I have to say, it is. It has ta been tangibly effective. You know, we we were the largest players against Steve King, a, a well-known white supremacist in Congress. Uh, we we went after him big time in in 2018 in the mid time midterms. We we're the largest outside players. I think we may have spent more money against him than he spent on himself. Uh, and then we uh, we weakened him severely, dropping him from I think a margin of victory in 2016 of 25, 23 or 25 points to a slim margin of 3% uh, in the midterms. And then we came back at him in the primaries and uh, finished him off in the primaries this, this time, uh, again, in, investing in a, a serious way at the, at the primary level. Uh, the same thing against Roy Moore. You know, We built a cross-partisan coalition to take him out. Uh, we built a cross-partisan coalition to take out uh, Devin Nunes. That's a work in progress still, but we've certainly um, you know, we dropped his victory margin in 2016 from, I think, 30 to 35 percent to 5 percent in, in the midterms. 
Um, Dana Rohrabacher, same thing. So we've succeeded and we're, we're doing that now against Trump and swing states. So building a cross-partisan coalition uh, to remove, uh, weaken and remove um, or, or block uh, 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 you know, uh, inspi or aspiring you know, divisive leaders in our country who threaten our democracy. So we feel quite good about the decision we made and, and frankly pleased that we remain true to ourselves as difficult as, as that can sometimes be. So I was scrolling through Standup's website and one of the things that stood out to me was a section where it said, Standup wants to secure and reform elections. Given President Trump's constant attacks on this year's election process, do you have any concerns about voting this year? I mean, there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about voting this year. I mean, uh, you know, Trump, Trump aside, and we'll get to that, uh, you know, we're facing this terrible pandemic that has cost the lives of at least 215,000 Americans, many of them unnecessarily. You know, obviously, it's a real threat to Americans' health. Uh, especially uh, many in our minority communities are being uh, hit, you know, particularly hard with it. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real issue. On top of that, you have a president who knows that he's losing this election and he is doing everything he can to sow, um, uh, you know, uh, concerns or doubt in, in the public about uh, whether their votes will be counted, whether we'll have a real election, that sort of thing. And at the same time, you have Republicans who are uh, only escalating their, um, you know, their efforts to, uh, to prevent people from participating in our democracy uh, by suppressing votes. And you know, in Texas, you know, incredibly uh, only um, allowing you know, one uh, drop-off box for your ballots per county. And in Texas, counties are gigantic uh, and, or they have tons of people in them. And it's just, you know, that's, so we, we face a lot of headwinds and, and you know, I, I'm worried about that, yes, but I'm also heartened by what I've seen in these early voting days where so many Americans are waiting in line for hours and hours and hours, you know? And I have to say that, I have to say that, you know, I served in the Central Intelligence Agency, which I think you know, and you know, you mentioned that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've served around incredible patriots. I mean, the, the kinds of people, you know, people who come to the CIA didn't fall, but a lot of them are former Navy SEALs or Marines. And, you know, they've done a lot of things or other they've done, you know, they worked in business or whatever. But, you know, but they're just incredible people who, you know, sacrifice a lot, you know, uh, live in isolation uh, to serve the country in far corners of the earth, um, you know, trying to prevent a terrorist attacks. and you know, work against, um, you know, uh, dictators overseas that are uh, destabilizing the world, things like that. And, and I have to say, though, I say all that because when I see those people waiting in line for, I saw a report, 11 hours, um, I, I have to say that I, I feel like those people are, those people are patriots too, cut from the same cloth uh, of, of so many others who sacrifice for our country. And so I, I'm encouraged by that. Um, you know, there's also, you know, it's, you know, people are, are making these great sacrifices to vote. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that we have Republican and Democrat officials, Democratic officials around the country at the state level who were, will ensure free and fair elections in their states. Um, I do expect Trump to challenge the election results. He has said as much that he's already said he will. The election, even before votes were being cast, he was saying that. He expects the election to be decided in the Supreme Court. We'll see. Um, today, we're seeing, uh, we're, we're really seeing the, uh, the escalation of a Russian disinformation campaign against Joe Biden. Um, you know, we'll perhaps turn back to that. So that's a challenge. There's, uh, there's also chatter in intelligence circles. There's been chatter about that in intelligence circles for for weeks or more likely month, more, more accurately months. There's also been chatter in intelligence circles for months about the Russians uh, hacking our uh, election infrastructure at the state and national level. And so we'll see if that happens, uh, but that's something that I'm concerned about too. Um, but the important thing is we, we all have to go out and vote. We have to vote. And it's not enough for us to just go out and vote. 
We have to mobilize others to vote. We can all do it. We all have spheres of influence. Some of our spheres of influence are big. You know, mine, mine now is much bigger than it was five years ago. Um, but, you know, you don't have to have a big sphere of influence to make a difference. We all need to make a difference within our own sphere of influence, with family, friends, people who are connected to us on social media. It's so important. It's so important. I have a friend who here in Utah, where I am, who voted for Trump. She wasn't a friend in 2016. She was, she's a friend now. And, but she voted for Trump in 2016. Now she's planning to vote for Biden. And, um, you know, she's not been, you know, very politically active in the past, um, but she recently decided to post, uh, you know, publicly her support for Joe Biden. She lives in a very red area of a very red state. And it's been very interesting to see um, so many of her friends who she, who, you know, have, are Republicans, uh, take courage themselves and post similar things and comments and quiet and some of them quietly say to her that they agree with her and they're gaining the courage to say something too. That has a ripple effect. It starts with one person, but imagine, you know, when, when we speak up, you know, people, a lot of people turn out, tune out political ads these days. They tune out the news, especially in red states and red areas, but elsewhere too. Uh, the real influencers in our country uh, are us. You know, we, we can influence the way our friends feel. And so, you know, I, I'm an advocate for having the tough discussions with family members and friends who may be supporting Trump. They may not like him, but they may be planning to vote for him. We need to share our concerns. Those of us who are opposed to him need to share our concerns with them. There are, I still believe, good people supporting Trump uh, that are locked in an alternative information space. It's, it's amazing, it's, it's frightening, but, um, but it's the reality. The only people who are going to break through that are us. You know, we are the people, who, you know, with trusted, with relationships of trust and concern that pre-exist Trump with these people. So, you know, we all need to do that. And I think that's part of the answer even after the election as well. So you were just talking about the media. Um, and I know stand-up does a lot to ensure a free, free press. Um, but we've seen on both sides of the aisles, politicians attacking the media. Um, Trump has called them the enemy of the people. The Obama administration has gone off um, prosecuting whist whistleblowers. So how can we ensure the freedom of press and keep the trust in our press while these attacks are happening? Well, I think the first thing is we need to make sure that we're electing leaders who understand and, uh, and up, you know, and, and re part of our system of self-rule, our democracy. The truth is, without the press, we don't have a democracy. We don't have a republic, whatever you want to call it. We don't have it without the press. And we need leaders who will reflect that reality. And if we, you know, if we encounter leaders who are running for office, uh, who, you know, say things like fake news and, and attack the press as the enemy of the people, for example, we have to make sure that we defeat them. Because what they're doing is they're attacking one of the most essential safeguards of our liberty, and we, we absolutely just cannot allow it. And so that's the first step. I think, you know, on the right, for a long time, people have felt that there's been, you know, there's been liberal bias in the mainstream media. I, I'm someone who agrees with that, by the way, as, as somebody who is a person of, of faith uh, and who comes from the right. Although I say, you know, I'll, I'll speak of myself as a conservative and a disaffected Republican. I, you know, in, in this conversation, but I, I also want to acknowledge that the political spectrum and political coalitions are in great transition now and where we will all end up may not be, even as we maintain our commitment to our own principles, you know, where we end up in terms of political affiliation may not be where we started. And I think that's that, that great transition is happening. Um, but I will say that, you know, prior to Trump, uh, I felt as a lot of people did that there was sort of, a, you know, you could just, sometimes you just pick it up in the word choice or in the way um, many mainstream journalists talk about conservatives or people of faith, that there was just a, a little bit of a lack of respect for us. Um, and I think, you know, over time, that created a situation where a, a lot of antipathy grew within the right and no one was there to say, okay, well, wait a second, the press is still very important to our freedom. And then Trump came along and it was very convenient for him that that's the way many Republicans felt because he needed to attack the press because he had made the decision 
that all right aspiring authoritarians make, which is to serve himself above the people. Once you make that decision as a leader in office, exploiting your office to serve your own interests over those of the people, that puts you on a path, which is, is what I refer to as you know the, the authoritarian playbook, in which you have to attack the press. And so it was very convenient that that you know those feelings existed on the right, and that nobody had sort of addressed them in a healthy way, and he exploited them and has you know grown them and you know uh, used them to destroy the credibility of the press on the right. And I, I will say that since then, I think the press has gone since Trump has been elected, and he's you know uh, give you know, made this criticism of the press self-servingly, of course. I do think the press has uh, gone above and beyond in most cases to limit that the kind of bias I was talking about, even to the point of going too far in you know giving um, you know the benefit of the doubt to Trump and Trumpism at times when when they shouldn't have. So look, I think it's you know we've got to hold you know we've we've all got to protect the media by electing leaders who respect it. And understand, even if they disagree with it, you can be critical of the media without calling it the enemy of the state and fake news. You know, you, and I, that's fine. We should all have a discussion about whether a report was fair or honest. We can, we should have that discussion. It should be a lively debate that we have with each other and with the press, and we should hold the press accountable too. We can do that while um, while ensuring that um, that the freedom of the press is protected by uh, making sure that our representatives, the people who we choose to represent us. Uh, are committed to protecting our freedom through the protection of the press. I think that that is the key thing we need to do. So I would like to shift to like some questions that have been submitted by attendees. Um, a couple of people have asked about partisanship on the courts. Um, and what is your stance as a conservative on the appointment of Judge Amy Coney Barrett while you still oppose Trump? Yeah, I um, so I have I have concerns about the court. I, I fear that the court is being politicized. Uh, I think it was a, a terrible thing that uh, Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans did to not even consider the nomination of of Merrick Garland uh, in President Obama's final year. I personally don't like the argument that a president in their final year can't appoint a, a, a justice to the Supreme Court. The Constitution says nothing about that. Uh, that's a key function of of, of a president uh, to to appoint justices in there, you know, any time. And and if we're going to say they can't do it in their final year, uh, then what other key functions of the presidency are we saying they can't do in the final year? So that I have concerns about that. The Republicans have tried to have it both ways in the Senate, where they you know they they decided that they weren't going to um, weren't going to even consider Merrick Garland's nomination. And I believe some of them, it may have been Mitch McConnell, don't quote me on this, you, you'll need to fact check me on this and I'll need to do that to myself. But somebody said that I think it may have been Mitch McConnell, that if they had to hold the seat open for eight years, they were gonna do that. So basically what they were saying is they were gonna decrease the number of justices on the Supreme Court from nine to eight. And so that's sort of, a, that's a way to, that's a reverse court pack, you know, where you're, um, you're, it's all about you know the dilution, the changing of the ratio on the court, and if you're going to decrease the number of justices on the court for a period of time for political purposes, that achieves the effectively the same thing as court packing does, and so I, I view that as a, either the same thing or akin to it. Uh, and then to make matters worse, here the Republicans in the Senate are, uh, and in the White House, making an appointment in the final month of the Trump presidency, and you know, or uh, before the election at least, in the final months of his presidency, or at least of this term, um, trying to jam through, trying to jam through one of their own. So I think it's incredible hypocrisy. Uh, and I think it, it is going to, if, if they do it and they seem poised to do it, they apparently have the votes. Um, they are going to, uh, I think they risk, they, they risk delegitimizing the court as well as delegitimizing the Senate, um, both by doing this, um, but also by its consequences. You know, I, I hear even, you know, very reasonable Democrats talking about the need 
to pack the court uh, to change the number of justices there are on the court if Biden comes to power in the Senate, uh, the Democrats take the Senate. And, you know, after what they've experienced with Republicans over the last few years, over the last six years, in that regard, you, you can sort of understand why they're saying that. Um, I think Joe Biden said recently he's uncomfortable with that. I share that view. I'm uncomfortable with it too. But I also understand how the Democrats got to where, where they arrived at, where they are on that. Um, and so what, what I think is ideal is what I wish would happen is I wish senators would get together and, uh, you know, a gang of eight or whatever it takes and, um, and make a deal. And that deal would be that, you know, Democrats would commit to not adding to the court and Republicans would put off this confirmation uh, until they would at least be consistent with their views uh, in the last year of Obama's presidency and put this off until the next presidency. Even though I'll say again, I do not think it's a good idea to limit, uh, you know, a president from, you know, being able to perform this duty in general uh, in the last year of the, their presidency. The other problem I have is that um, uh, one of the other problems is that President Trump rose to power. I say it over and over till my face is blue, and I'm not sure enough people care. I, I don't know that they do, but. President rose to power with the help of a foreign adversary. The race, he lost the popular vote and he, bare, he, he won by 70 something votes in exactly the right places. And, you know, to say that Republican influence and hacking efforts and disinformation campaigns had no effect is to say that campaigns have no effect. They ran a campaign, an illegal campaign in his support and it certainly was enough to, it, it shaped the entire, some, speaking from somebody who, someone who participated in it, it shaped the entire uh, presidential campaign in 2016. And to suggest that what the Russians did did not influence 70,000 voters in America, in a country of you know, well over 100 million voters, 140 million voters, Deirdre, you can correct me on that. Someone, one of your students can correct me on that. Um, 140 million voters, I believe, you know, they, you know, they, um, you know, to, to the idea that 70,000 votes couldn't have been persuaded by the, Demo by, by the Russians campaign for Trump, I think is really naive. We really are saying that it has no impact. So the reason why I'm saying that is that there is a political connection between our court. There is a political uh, element of the court, and that is that our elected leader, our president, nominates justices to the court and that president should be duly elected and uh when you receive massive uh, help from a foreign adversary or a form of, from a foreign entity in general and you then rise to power because of that foreign help and especially when you still lose the popular vote you don't have that legitimacy and so i'm quite concerned about president trump appointing three justices during his first term reshaping the court in a way that is inconsistent with the will of the, of the American people. Now, I say that as somebody who, in terms of uh, you know, judicial philosophy, uh, I am an originalist. I believe that the law should be interpreted as it was uh, intended when it was written, and that if we don't like it, we need to change it, um, but that's not up to judges. So you know, I, I like the appointment of originalist justices, but I care more about the integrity of our uh, of our institutions and about the public trust, and if we lose those things, then we you know then we, we lose our entire system of self rule, and so that's what I'm concerned about. Lastly, I'll say that I've been concerned about some of the answers that uh, that Amy Coney Barrett has given over the last couple of days, including uh, being unwilling to say that you know she would uh, support or expect a president to agree to uh, a peaceful transition of power. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say you're not going to uh, concede an election. Um, there are uh, people who do that. Um, but it's another thing to be a sitting president and not to commit to a peaceful transition of power. In my view, that is a threat of violence because of their, you know, their, their, their positions. And it is an incredible breach of, um, of, of, of duty, of integrity, uh, and it, it, it really, you know, threat, it really could create violence across the country. And for her not to be able to simply say there should be a peaceful transition of power 
is, is quite shocking and concerning. So another question submitted by our attendees was um, on ranked choice voting, which uh, stand-up supports. Do you think ranked choice voting is a better alternative um, on the national stage, or is it more for state and local governments? I would like to see it uh, where, you know, I, I'd like to see it everywhere. I'd like to see it at the local level, the state level, the national level. Uh, you know, ranked choice voting, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure this group understands what, what it is, but you know, the, uh, the reason why I and why our organization, why we're behind it, why we back it as a reform and work to institute it around the country is that it, it, the first thing is that it empowers voters to more fully express their preferences in elections. I mean, just think about all the choices we have, right? When you, you had, you know, when you were deciding where to go to school, you got to, you know, you probably started looking at 20 different schools or, or you were, you knew you wanted to be at, at Penn uh, all along, one of the two. Um, but you had the option to look at all kinds of schools, hundreds of schools, dozens of schools, perhaps, that, that you thought were possibly a good match for you, whatever. Uh, when you go to the store, you've got all kinds of options. When you're, you know, choosing someone to date, you've got all kinds of options. When you're choosing classes to take, you have all kinds of options. I mean, we have choice in, in so many aspects, all aspects, especially in America, in so many aspects, uh, it really in everything in, in life. Uh, and then when it comes to voting, you get into the voting booth and typically, you know, it's either this, this person or that person. And it just, it just doesn't seem, it just seems outdated um, that you, first you only have those two options in my view, but secondly, you, you have to, it's just one or the other. You can't fully express your views. And so um, what I would like to see is the voters be able to fully say, look, I, you know, I prefer this person, but then this person, and then this person, and then this person. And the impact that would have, and that I believe it does have where this reform has been instituted, is that it, it changes the incentives for, uh, for candidates. Because Alfie, let's say that you and I are running against each other, and let's say you've got a really strong base of support, right? And which, of course, you would. And, you know, I've got a, a nice little sub base of support myself. You know, if we're, if it's, if the decision is binary, me versus you, somebody gets into the ballot box and they have to choose me or you, then you and I are going to try to probably tear each other apart uh, in this election uh, to, you know, because that's what the incentives are. We want to just turn as many people off to each other and pull as many people over to our side. With ranked choice voting, you and I actually now have a different set of incentives. Now we benefit by, you know, I, I benefit, for example, from going to your supporters, and I know that your strongest supporters, they're never going to, I'm never going to change their minds that they should support me because you're a great leader and you convinced, you've showed them that and they're with you. I'm never going to pull them away, but I may be able to convince them to, to consider me their second choice. And so because of that, I have reason to find common ground with you and even say great things about you. Yes, I need to tactfully differentiate myself between, you know, from you. Um, but, but I also need to go to your supporters and say, look, you know, Alfie's right about X, Y, and Z. I support that too. I, and I'm glad he's fighting for that. I fight for that too. I hope you'll choose me as your second choice. I know you're going to support Alfie, you know, uh, for number one. And you would have that incentive to, to do that with my base of supporters too. Now, that sounds nice. First of all, more civil discussions, right? More civil debates, more civil campaigns. But why does that actually matter for, for America? I mean, yes, we'd all love more civility, right? Our, our, our you know, stress levels and anxiety levels would go down. But, but also, um, this, these kinds of incentives then help us find common ground on policy issues that allow us to actually advance solutions to modern challenges. And so our governance, I believe, improves uh, with these incentives. And, and that's also why it matters. So it's, it's, about, it's about empowering the voter to more effectively and fully express their preferences, which is a good thing, I believe. And it's about uh, uh, inspiring more effective leadership, more unifying and effective leadership. So one last question before we get on to like an open discussion with the attendees. Um, a lot of the students have been wondering like how to get into public service, either through internships or jobs. 
um, but it's been rather challenging during the pandemic. So what is your advice to young people who want to get into public service? Yeah, certainly challenging in the pandemic. I mean, I, I don't know for sure because I'm not in your shoes, but I imagine that, you know, some of you are doing political work or volunteering or doing political internships. But, you know, part of that experience ideally is mentorship, right? You, you want to be, you need to be, you, you, you are advantaged by, you know, interaction with coworkers and with, um, with um, leaders of your organizations, wherever you're, wherever you're working. Uh, and when you're remote, it's very difficult for that to happen. It's frankly something I worry about with, worry about with my own team, because here I am in, you know, hidden in the mountains of Utah, and my team is all over the place. And I worry that without, you know, more direct contact, they're not, their opportunity to grow isn't as significant as it should be, um, as it could be. But, but what I will say is what I would urge you to do is still, you know, if you're interested in politics, still go somewhere where you feel like you can make a difference. Realize that the whole country is struggling with this, you know, and, and there, are, there are clear advantages to working remotely, frankly. I, I like parts of it. Um, but, you know, so there are challenges related to that. Um, but I, I would say make a special effort to be mentored uh, uh, by those you work with and work for uh, in spite of the, the physical distance. I think that's important. Even if you, you know, go to ask if, if you're worried that you don't have that naturally, it's not built into the program, go to whoever you're working for and, and, you know, or other people who you engage with and, and, you know, ask for that, say, look, you know, could, could we have, you know, I'll be here for two months, two and a half months, three months. Um, could we have coffee? Could we have lunch once a month? You, you know, we'll, you know, have lunch via Zoom and, uh, and, and let's just talk. Can we do that once a month while I'm here? I would do that. Do that with a few people, um, but make sure you get, take responsibility for being mentored. Um, and you don't even have to use that word. I mean, sometimes that might, I think most people will want to help you um, and they'll, they'll, they'll be honored, by the way, if you say, would, would, you, would you mentor me a little bit over the summer? Could we, you know, but you, you don't necessarily have to say it that way. You can say, look, you know, I, I'd like to learn more about your, your, your career and your experiences and your views. Can, can we just have lunch once a month uh, between, you know, you know, now and, and when I depart? Uh, I, and if you do that with a few people, I think you'll, you, you'll do two things. Number one, you'll learn a bunch from them. Uh, and number two, you'll establish a relationship with those people that will likely be valuable for you, pro you know, perhaps for your entire careers in, in some cases. So I really recommend that. People want to help. Most people are going to want to help you. So I just wouldn't, and they'll be flattered that you're coming to them asking. And, and so I would just encourage you to do it. And Alfie, if I could jump in but before we go to the questions that um, everyone has. You're kind of, Evan, you're the poster child for what I hope students do when they think about their careers, and that is they take, that they take risks and that they do what they think is the right thing to do, and they not worry too much about sort of that next step and if that's a career disaster, because you've, you've done all kinds of things and you're fine. Yeah, yeah. So do you want me to respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm fine. Um, I, I will say that I will say this. I, so I have I've always done with with the exception of my time at Goldman Sachs. I've always done what I've been passionate about. And mostly what I've been passionate about was uh, helping the world be a better place. And I've done that in different forms. I was a missionary for my church. I worked for the United Nations with refugees uh, as, a, as a student, as a full-time volunteer with UN, UNHCR in Jordan, uh, working with refugees from Syria and Iraq and Africa. Um, I, uh, obviously, I served in the CIA and worked mostly against terrorists during that time uh, and, and against some dictators. I... Um, I then worked on Capitol Hill, you know, I, but I also worked at Goldman Sachs. I worked at Goldman Sachs because I was coming out of, of Wharton and uh, knew that I would learn a lot there. And in fact, I did. And I, I'm glad I, I had that experience. But, you know, it, it was a departure um, from uh, what I have done in the past and since, which has done what I feel passionately about. And, and what I feel passionately about at the most fundamental level is making the world a better place. 
So, um, so, but let me just talk about for a second why that's important. When you do what you're passionate about, you enjoy doing it. And when you enjoy doing something, you do a lot of it. And when you do a lot of something, you get good at it. And when you get good at it, you, um, you know, you have impact. And when you have impact, people give you more opportunities. And when you have more opportunities, you make even greater impact. And all of a sudden, so it all, it, it starts from, from, from there. And it, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a career strategy as much as it is, a, a you know, a way to be true to yourself and perhaps to make a difference. But I, I think you, you know, maybe it's a bit idealistic, but I think it's a, and everybody's different. I, I can't do things that I'm not passionate about. I, I just shut down. It's either I'm passionate about this. And so I'm going to do it. I'm going to do, do, do it to, to the best of my ability, or I just can't do it. So I don't, I recognize not everyone is like that. And I think I, you know, should be, um, you know, should factor that a little bit into my commentary, but I do believe that, I do believe that there's enormous, that it's, it's a good career strategy to do what you're passionate about. Uh, for those reasons, because it starts that domino effect. The other thing I'll say is that service is really important and it also is a career strategy. And let me tell you why. So, and I, I'll share a story, uh, you know, just a little story about this. When I, when I joined the CIA, I was uh, uh, entering my, I was, I was between my sophomore and junior year at Brigham Young University. And I joined this program where I would do a semester at the agency and a semester back at school until I graduated. So that, that's what I did. Um, but, you know, I graduated, uh, long story short, study abroad, graduated, et cetera, um, end up at the CIA and, and about to go into to clandestine operations training and 9-11 happens. And I, so I go through my training. It takes about two years. And, uh, and then they ship me off to South Asia and the Middle East and, and all of that to join the fight against Al Qaeda. And when I got there, you know, it was about two years after 9-11, but that was, we now of course recognize very early on in, in the fight against terrorism. And uh, the, the agency was still full of people who had joined during the Cold War. And so a lot of people, when we started, we turned into a bit of a paramilitary organization for a while, you know, a lot of people who are older than me, you know, they just didn't sign up for that. They, they signed up for cocktail hours in Vienna and, you know, maybe, 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 you know, uh, some, you know, uh, intriguing spy activities on the streets of Paris. Um, but they didn't sign up to go meet in the dead of night in a dark, dusty alley in Peshawar. Uh, with an Al Qaeda operative, that's not what they signed up for. Um, but as a young young guy in my mid twenties, and which doesn't seem young to you, I, I'll acknowledge, but it was young. And I, uh, you know, I in my first assignment, and I volunteered to go do those do the things that no one else wanted to do. I, I went to the worst places, did the worst jobs. I did, you know, did you know the hardest ops. You know, if something needed to be done on Christmas, I did it. You know, I, I did everything. You know, for when uh, vacations, um, again, went to the worst places. And so because I was willing to do that, and this is the point, because I was willing to do that, I gained a lot of experience that even people who were senior than me were not gaining. And that, it, that was a big deal because that meant that you know, after a few years of that, I knew things that people who had been in the agency for 20 years didn't know. And so you don't have to be in the CIA and to have that exact experience. It could be anything. You could, you know, go work for a humanitarian organization and no one wants to go to this place because it's that terrible. And it's just, no one wants to do it. Well, if you do it, then you gain that experience and know it and that other people don't have, or you're at work and there's some there's some project, you know, let's say you work for a company and there's some, something that's some really hard thing that needs to be solved or tackled or done. No one wants to do it because it's hard and unpleasant. You do that thing. And when you do that, you gain experience that other people don't have. And in the service realm, you're, you know, whenever you're serving somewhere, 
you know, it's, you're, you're usually not getting rich from doing it. You know, I certainly didn't get rich serving in the agency. I'm not getting rich doing what I'm doing now. Um, it's, you know, it's service. And, um, you know, when you, when you, uh, you know, usually in those situations, the, the system of our, our lives, our governments, our economies, they failed in some way. And so there's a problem, right? There's a problem that doesn't, that hasn't been solved and that isn't solved by the normal business of the machine of life, whether it's government or business or civil service or, you know, what, whatever. There's a problem. There's a breakdown. You know, people are starving. Terrorists are thriving. You know, governments are oppressing their people. Um, you know, whatever it is, you know, those are the, those are the you know, services required, not when things are going well, but when things are going badly. And so when you volunteer to serve, you, A, you're, you're learning something that other people, a lot of people, other people don't know, but you're learning something about how to solve a difficult problem. And so that is enormously valuable. And so, and, and if you do that, and the time to do that, I think is early on in your career, especially because the older you get, the less you wanna do that kind of thing, because you'd rather spend time with family and maybe have kids, that kind of thing. Um, but when you're young, you know, I would just urge you, if, if you feel compelled to do it, serve, do the hard things, learn the things that other people aren't learning because they're not willing to do the hard things. And you're going to set yourself up. You're going to give yourself a competitive advantage going forward that, you know, if you want to go to grad school, it'll help you with that. If you, you know, whatever you do later in life, you'll know something that other people don't know, you know? And so, I think those two things do what you're passionate about. Yes. But, um, but if you, if you feel it, then serve as well. And I think in addition to doing it for the right altruistic reasons, you'll find that you'll benefit uh, handsomely from, from it as well. That was really great advice. Um, so I think we have questions. Someone's raising their hand, Matthew current. Um, if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, hey, I'll be up. Um, thank you, Mr. McMullen, for um, coming to speak with us. A uh, question about the CIA and then kind of your earlier career in general. Um, as someone who's thought a little bit about um, trying to join the CIA in the future, why did you choose operations over analysis or what, however it was split up back when you joined? And then also thinking about, you know, starting in the CIA and then going into business. If you were to have started in business and then went into the CIA, do you think, you know, like after you had left both of those, you would look at it a different way or do you feel like, you know, um, wh whichever way you do it, you know, either way it works out great. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for the question. And, and please call me Evan. Um, yeah, as far as why I chose, as far as why I chose uh, the director of operations rather than being an operations officer rather than being an analyst, it really was just that that's, that's my personality. You know, when, when I was a student, an undergrad at Brigham Young University, they wouldn't let students come anywhere near ops, okay? That changed, and it, maybe it's changed back in a million times since then, I don't know, but I know it did change. But when I was there, they didn't let students anywhere near the ops. And so I worked in an analytical group, and we looked at you know, Saudi Arabia and Iraq and, and Israel, and, and that's what we did. And um, you know, I wanted to be, I knew I wanted to be on the ops side and I sort of kept that to my, I asked about it when I was a student applying and they said, look, we don't allow students on the ops side. So I said, okay, very good. I'll take what I can get. I'll get in the door and I'll make a move eventually. And so I, I got myself in and, uh, and then, and did, you know, worked as a student, as a student, as a student trainee in, uh, in the directorate of intelligence, as it was called. Uh, with a team of analysts. And, um, you know, it was great. It was awesome. It, you know, I, I, I mean, as a kid, I had to pinch myself. I mean, I, I you know, I was, I, yeah, I was in my mid twenties or well, I was not in my, actually not in my mid twenties yet. I was younger than that. I think I, I was a little bit older cause I'd served a, a mission for my church for two years in Brazil, which, you know, and I did the CIA program, that program. So it slowed me down. But I think I was, you know, 23 when I received my offer from the agency, which you guys will have been graduated by then. But uh, most of you. But um, but anyway, you know, I was reading, uh, you know, intercepts of, um, you know, there was a country in our space, and there was another country that had its own operatives inside that country, 
and I was reading, they would do their operations, their clandestine operations in this third country. So country A was doing its clandestine operations in country B. And I was reading their reports. And as a young person, it was pretty amazing to read about the clan, read the blow, the, the you know, the, the blow by blow accounts of this, of country A's uh, clandestine operations in country B. Um, and I, and that was amazing. Or reading what, you know, foreign leaders were saying to each other on, in private conversations or what our human, uh, our human sources were reporting about, you know, military and economic and political, you know, things. I mean, I, I also read terrible, terrible things about, for example, Saddam Hussein and his family, you know, you know, I, I remember reading about, um, you know, the, you know, their, how they would abduct, you know, women from, um, you know, uh, uh, um, rival religious communities, neighborhoods, and, and do terrible things to them and, and ultimately kill them. I remember reading things like that. So there was, there was a lot of tough things to read too. But it was an incredible experience to, to read that. And I went off a bit on a tangent, but I'm sort of just recalling some of the things that uh, as a student I, was, I had access to, it was incredible. And then I, I actually participated in writing um, briefings for the Presidential Daily Brief, the PDB, uh, that you know, would go to the president, obviously. And that was an incredible experience too. But that job was very much like being a permanent grad student, a lot of research and a lot of writing. Ultimately, I knew that I was, I was I'm an activist. You know, I want to do things. I don't want to, um, I don't, I'm less interested in analyzing what other people do and more interested in, in being an actor and in proactively doing things. And, uh, and that's why I was a better fit for the operational side of the house. But I will say that, you know, the people who end up on the analytical side of the house, they're built for that. And they're amazing people, amazing professionals. And so it really is just, um, you know, it, it just depends on your personality. The agency's very good at saying, oh, you're a good fit for this, or you're a good fit for that. Um, but hopefully you have a sense for it yourself. But it really, it really depends on who you are. I needed to be on the operational side of the house. That was where I fit in. That's that sort of that's my um, that that fits my personality. But that's not true, obviously, for everyone. Uh, and as far as whether to do business first or second, um, I think it, it it could go either way. I think increasingly, you know, and even then, the agency preferred people with more experience than I had uh, to go into operations. But because I had gotten in early, they you know they they let me in. They let others other young people in too. But um, but mostly they like people who have a little more experience. So what I would say is, you know, if you're interested in that, graduate, go get a grad degree or, or go get some experience in, 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 you know, the private sector. Um, it'd be great if you worked overseas, although that's not a total requirement. There are many different routes you can take. You can work in investment banking. You, you can work in consulting. You can do other things. Um, but uh, but once you feel like you've had maybe get get yourself a couple of years of experience, two to four years of experience, and then start applying to the agency and see where it goes. You know, work on your if you feel inclined to do it this way. You know, work on your career in the private sector, develop it, uh, and uh, and then once you know, I would say two to four years, uh, then then start applying. Uh, I'd probably be more on the side of four years post undergrad if you graduate at if you graduate at age 21 or 22. I'd give yourself four years of professional experience and then start applying. And if you don't make it in the first time, I would say, don't give up. One of my best friends in the agency was one of, one of the most effective officers I worked with uh, serving, uh, you know, against terrorism, ter you know, working against terrorists. He, uh, he only got, he was only hired on his third attempt. You know, they said no to him twice and he just kept trying. He had such conviction about his desire to serve in that capacity that he kept trying and they really like to see that. They like people who are persistent uh, and, you know, and passionate about serving in that way. Great, thank so, you, that was very helpful. Uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to stay. I mean, if, okay. I, I don't wanna keep you, you either. So, I mean, whatever, whatever you wanna do, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to stay for 10 or 15 minutes extra. So I see Carmen 
has her hand raised. Yes, I do. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. McMullen. Uh, I just had a question kind of the intersection of your time at the CIA and also in the political realm. Personally, I have an extreme interest in the CIA, but I would also to like to make social and change in this country through the political realm as well. So I was kind of wondering, how did that transition work for you? How did you reckon yourself kind of with switching from foreign service into working specifically for the United States government and inside of it? Uh, I was wondering if you had any tips kind of on that transition? If, for example, if I would like to work in the CIA and then switch to government and political parties, what could you say about that? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think you can you could work at a sort of a beginning level in politics and then transition to the CIA. That's another thing that does happen. You could work in Congress and then apply to the agency. That's a great way to prepare yourself with some early professional experience and um, understanding about you know politics and leadership, which which can be valuable at the agency, uh, as we look at other countries and their politics and leadership. Um, so that's you can do that. You can also go from the agency to to politics. That's been sort of my route. My route was uh, you know um, you know I, when I was at the agency, I had this. All I can say is that it was a sixth sense that I just had this feeling that I needed to spend some time on Capitol Hill. And I remember going to my bosses, at my operations bosses, these grizzled operatives saying, hey, I'd like to, I see this program on the computer system over here and I would like to do a rotation on Capitol Hill. And they looked at me like I had two heads. You know, why you, you know, with the coolest job in the world is the way they thought of it. And I agreed. Why would you want to go do a one year rotation and, you know, push papers around on Capitol Hill? And so they basically kicked me out of their office and that was that. I just said, okay, well, I'll, I'll just suppress that desire for now and we'll see what happens. Um, and so what happened was, you know, I did my service, completed my service at the agency, went to Wharton, went to Goldman. While I was at Goldman, uh, I, you know, unexpectedly someone reached out to me, someone, a former senior agency officer and said, you know, Ed Royce is taking over the foreign affairs committee in the house and he would like somebody of your background to, serve as an advisor, a national security advisor to him. Do you want to do it? And, you know, of course, it was going to be a, a pretty decent pay cut. But I recognized that. I said, all right, this, it's here. You know, I've known that I, I felt that I needed to do this. I felt inspired to do this. And I had written it off. I thought I'd be in Silicon Valley eating tacos and sushi and going to Giants games for the rest of my life. And I didn't care about anything else. But here, all of a sudden, was the opportunity to go work on the Hill, something that for years I felt like I needed to do. So after a few discussions with the committee, I decided to do it. While I, so I went to the Foreign Affairs Committee, I was a senior advisor there, I did that for two years. While I was doing that, I had an, a, a realization about something. I realized that foreign policy was largely driven by domestic politics. And if I wanted to actually have an impact on foreign policy, I needed to do more than be a national security advisor on foreign policy issues and instead, you know, enter the realm of domestic politics. So I was, I've been, I was thinking about that for, for the, the second year of my time on the, uh, on the staff of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And then, um, you know, I was asked to come up and give a briefing to House Republican leadership on, on the rise of ISIS. And after that briefing, uh, I received an offer to come up and be the uh, chief policy director for the House Republicans, which would mean I would lead a team of policy analysts and policy directors uh, that um, dealt with everything, uh, all policies, foreign and domestic, for the House Republican Conference. And so I recognized that as that was the step I had been feeling I needed to take. And so I took it. And, uh, you know, that, that was when I witnessed the whole collapse of the Republican Party and the Trumpism. And that, you know, and that gave way to my, you know, decision to run for office. And so, you know, that's how it all played out. It played out in a very unique way. Um, you know, uh, I, I will have to, you know, I have to say, you know, I've, I've referenced my religious views before. I, I'm not trying to push them on you, but rather be transparent about the way I think and live my life and do things. But you know, I, I have, you know, I, I do pray, I believe in prayer, you know, I have approached these decisions in life, you know, looking for, you know, um, guidance on, on, you know, where, what I should do in life. And, and, and I, you know, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that, that I believe that has played a part, you know, and I believe and I'm not unique in that anyone who seeks that 
I believe, um, can, can have that. But, but even if you don't agree and if you have different views, that's fine. Um, but, you know, that is, that, is the, that is the path that I anticipated and then realized step by step over time. As, and I will say that I would just give you one little warning that, you know, when you serve in the CIA, the way people in the country perceive people who serve in the CIA, you don't get as much credit as you do when you serve in the military. You know, when people serve in the military, they get, rightfully so, by the way, you know, we, we respect our heroes, we appreciate their service. Um, when you serve in the CIA, the reception is a little bit different. And in some, in some ways, I think it's not a surprise and maybe even appropriate. It's a secretive organization. We should be, there should be congressional oversight. We should be careful with those kinds of organizations, although they're very necessary. Um, but there's some distrust. And so there's a lot of people out there I see commenting, oh, well, he was a, he's a former CIA guy, therefore you can't trust him. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, wow, you know, I put my life at risk more times literally than I can remember for all of you. And that's the way I'm treated. And so it's, you know, it's just something to consider. I, I wouldn't change anything about what I've done in that regard, but, but just know that, um, that there, there's that. Hopefully after we get past this whole Trump, Russia thing, um, more people will have more respect for people in the intelligence community. But, you know, right now, sometimes it's tough. So um, if anyone else has any questions, you can raise your hands. Um, I think we're good. Yeah. Cool. Oh, Lindsay. All right. One more question. Sorry. Thank you so much. This is so helpful. I'm also really interested in a career in intelligence, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you chose the CIA over, say, FBI or another three-letter agency. Yeah, I mean, actually, I started the the way I the way I became interested at all in intelligence or law enforcement because in in the beginning, sort of the difference between the two was fuzzy. Uh, but my dad brought home a a movie. We I didn't grow up with a lot of money. My family didn't, so you know, my dad, our big our big fun was my dad would stop by Blockbuster Video on the way home and rent a bunch of videos. You know, you probably don't even know what those are. And uh, we would uh, plug them into a machine and we would watch them with popcorn. One of the videos that he brought home was uh, uh, the Three Days, of, Three Days of the Condor, um, which is an old Robert Redford spy film. And it's still a good one. I recommend it. Um, very retro, but I think you'll still enjoy it. Um, but uh, I... I, that, that movie captured my imagination and I started reading all kinds of books, but I first actually started out reading books about the FBI and um, read everything I could about the FBI and then started reading everything I could about the CIA. As I was doing that, you know, I started doing that when I was like 13 or something like that. So for years, read all these books about the CIA and the FBI. As I did that, I, my eyesight, you know, became less than perfect and I had to get glasses and that I recognized that was going to be an impediment to me working for the Bureau, at least at the time. So that, that I started, and I don't know if that's still an issue or not. And of course there's LASIK, so I don't even know if it matters anymore, but that pushed me more in the direction of the CIA. But the more I read about the agency, the more I, I felt, I just had this feeling again that this was a way that I could serve the country and I, that I could be effective given my own personal talents, uh, which were still in formation at that early stage. But I just had this sense that I could be an effective agency officer and that I would be able to serve the country in a meaningful way in that capacity. And so I just continued reading about it as much as possible. And when I was about 16 years old, I, I called the agency. I remember sitting on my parents' bed in the summer. They were out of town and I grabbed the phone. It was connected to the wall and it had a rotary thing. And I, you know, called 411 because that's how you got information. There was no internet. And I, that sounds crazy. Um, and uh, I asked for the CIA and they, it, well, first they asked for the location. You had to give them the location. And I said Langley, because that was the name of where CIA headquarters was. And the 411 operator kept telling me there was no Langley. And I thought, this is crazy. Of course, there's a Langley. Okay, just give me the CIA. Surely you have their number. 
Uh, finally, I realized that Langley is not a place that actually exists. Uh, the CIA headquarters exists in a place called McLean, Virginia. And so my little 16 year old self said, okay, I, I would like to, a listing in McLean, Virginia. They said, fine, what do you want? I want the CIA. They connected me to the CIA, connected me. And this old man answered the phone and said, um, uh, hello, can I help you? And I said, yes, is this the CIA? Uh, uh, well, who are you calling for, sir? And I said, is this the CIA? I was a little frustrated. Sir, who are you calling for? And I, then I knew that was the CIA and the hair on the back of my neck, I still had it at the time, uh, stood up and I thought, wow, this is the CIA. And so I remembered that I'd read about the recruitment center. And so I had enough um, you know, ability to think on my feet that I asked to speak with the recruitment center. And he said, very well. And he transferred me to the recruitment center. And uh, the receptionist there picked up the phone and said, you know, hello, recruitment center. And I began to speak with her, I had a little conversation with her. And, you know, I was gaining information. It was good. Uh, and at one point I mentioned to her that I had a, a red black belt, one step away from a black belt in Taekwondo. And I asked her if that would make me more competitive. And she laughed and said, how old are you? She didn't even answer the question. She just asked me how old I was. And I told her I was 15 or 16. And she laughed some more and she said, call back when you're older. And so I, um, uh, so I, I, uh, so two weeks later, I was older and I called back 411, got the operator, asked for the recruitment center, got the receptionist, and when I got to the receptionist, I asked for a recruiting officer and they transferred me right to somebody who called himself Arthur. I'm sure that wasn't his real name, but Arthur and I would have uh, you know, a, a number of conversations over the next few years about decisions I was making, about going to school, about joining the Marine Corps, about serving a mission for my church. And, you know, he said, uh, you know, don't join the Marines. It's too much of a commitment and we don't need those skills anymore. Well, he, he was really wrong about that. Um, the, the world changed. Um, but, you know, he said, don't, when you, I told him I was serving a mission to Brazil and he said, don't take my contact information with, with you. I'm internationally known. So I hid it away at home and went to serve in Brazil for two years. And when I came back, I dug up his information and reconnected with the agency and then a year and a half or later, they you know, I received an offer for them to start to start. So that's that's the long that's the long answer. But that's that's how it played out for me. I would really say that just Lindsay, it should be driven by your your own personality and your own interests. Some people are made to um, think in a very you know in a more rigid uh, way and are great to be law enforcement officers. Other people like me are you know a little more you know, are uncomfortable with that and need to be a little more freewheeling and creating in a way and are more comfortable with ambiguity. Um, and and I, I was, and that, that, you know, made me well suited for what I did. But, you know, we need good uh, special agents at the FBI. We need good oper operators at CIA. We need good analysts at both organizations. It really just depends on where you can find an opportunity and, and what, you, what you're built for. Great, thank you so much. So anyway, thank you all for, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with you. It was, uh, oh, I think I froze for a bit. I was just saying thank you. I've enjoyed the conversation and uh, appreciate the opportunity. You've been fantastic as always. Thank you so much, Evan.